Hello class, welcome back to Electromagnetics. Today we want to do a quick review of vector algebra. Um, you know, first defining what vectors are and then from there seeing how we can uh, work with them, multiplying, adding, so on uh, with, with vectors. Before we go on though, I want to start with a thought of the day. Uh, I'm trying to do this each uh, class period. So today we're looking at Proverbs 25, 2 through 3. And it states, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. And so this is an important verse to me because I think it, it affirms that you know we are to continue to research and investigate and, and try to learn more about God's creation. Because I think, I think he designed it that way for us to, to search out the things that he's concealed. You know, I heard it put one, put one way that I thought was pretty meaningful, you know, that if no matter what type of work we do, you know, whether we write poetry or write a story or write a song or create a circuit or whatever it is, you know, once we've created it, once we're done with it, you know, we want other people to look at it. We want them to examine it. We want them to, to try it out and, and, and learn more about it. And I think the reality is that as we do those types of things, not only do we learn more about an item or a creation, we also learn more about the one who created it. So I think that's why it's important that you know we do continue to research and, and search out things and do that. I think that's I think that's the way God designed it. So again, this is uh, the first section, and uh, we'll call it part one. So this will be vectors and fields. Uh, most of this should be review, hopefully, uh, with, with maybe some exception. But uh, during this, this lecture, we are going to review vector algebra. All right, so let's start with some definitions um, before we move forward and see how this works. Let me get my laser pointer going here. All right, so uh, first thing we want to talk about is scalars. So these are uh, things that only have a magnitude associated with them. Uh, we'll see these symbolized as we're going through equations as, as a letter usually that's light-faced, not bold, and most often is italicized. So an example of that would be like this A here. You see it's, it's uh, light-faced and italicized. But some uh, examples of scalar values are like temperature. So temperature doesn't have a direction associated, right? It's just it's a number or mass, how much something weighs, or what the mass of something is, or the charge. So these are examples of scalar items here. But next we have vectors. So this is probably more what we'll be dealing with. And so they have both a magnitude, like the scalars, and different from the scalars, they have a direction and space associated with them. So vectors are usually symbolized by a bold letter. And so example of that here is you see the bold B. And so this can, uh, some examples of this would be like velocity. Velocity has a direction, but it also has a, a meters per second or miles per hour or something associated with it. Or acceleration, that's usually acceleration in a certain direction, or a force is acting on an object in a certain direction. So they have directions uh, associated with them. So if we were to think of graphical representations of vectors, uh, this would be a good uh, good representation of that. So you can see they have uh, some length, which would be the magnitude uh, associated with them, but they also have direction. So these vectors are all very different. Uh, while these two are similar in magnitude, they're opposite in direction, so they're not equal. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you know the vector length of these lines is usually not associated with a distance, uh, like when we're dealing with just regular line segments. But they're associated with magnitudes of physical quantities uh, that the vectors represent. So it could be like the velocity or the acceleration or the force or something like that. So that's what the magnitude or the length of these vectors represents. So we need to think a minute that you know since a vector can have an arbitrary orientation that is pointing in any direction in three dimensions, we need to define a set of reference directions uh, at each and every point in space so that we can know how to compare these vectors. Uh, so to accomplish this, we'll consider three mutually orthogonal reference directions. 
uh, and direct unit vectors along those three directions. So one thing you need to keep in mind is orthogonal. What does that mean? So orthogonal means, if three things are orthogonal, that means you can't write any one of those in terms of the other two. So you know, if I have three totally opposite facing vectors, I can't like add or subtract or multiply the other two together to arrive at the third one. There's no way to do that. So that's what orthogonal means. You can't write one in terms of the other two or three or whatever functions you have. You can have orthogonal functions as well. So this is what that would look like. So these are your, your three orthogonal vectors. So again, I can't produce A1 by combining A2 and A3 in any fashion whatsoever. There's no way to do that. So that's why they are, they are orthogonal. So you can see this is what's known as a right-hand system. So what that means is if I were to take this vector and just push it around this way towards that with it you know, being fastened in the center, as I pushed it towards A1, and say there was a screw associated with that, it would screw in that direction of A3. So then we can have also have a left-handed system. So in this system, if I were to take A1 and push it towards A2, it would be a left-handed screw screw system. So that's where we get a right-handed and a left-handed system. Uh, hopefully you've uh, you know, run across this before in physics and maybe even in uh, calculus class. So when we have this coordinate system set up, now we can take any vector and we should be able to accurately represent it by using combinations of multiples of these unit vectors added together. So let's look at an example of that. If we have three, rep three vectors represented um, by one is 4A1, so that just means if you take the unit vector A1 and you extend it four times out in the A1 direction. You have 6A2. So again, that's if we take the 6A2 vector, the direction and everything, and then we extend it out six times. And then negative 2A3, so this time we extend, extend this one out twice, but we do it in the opposite direction that A3 is going. We should now be able to add these together and get a new vector. So let's see what that looks like. So here, what, here we have A1, a2 and A3. So that defines our coordinate system, right? So if we take this 4A1, that's this vector here. So it's a, a vector with a magnitude of 4 in the same direction as A1. So then we have 6A2. So that would be this guy right here. So A2 is here. So if we take a vector that's extended out six times as long as that, it goes that direction. And then we'll have minus 2a3. So a3 is going this way, so if we do negative 2, it's going to go the other direction, uh, two units, whatever those units are. <clears throat> so now we should be able to take these and add them together. So what happens is, let's start with the first one. So we go uh, out to here, 4a1. Now if we take this 6a2 and we slide it down here until its tail touches the tip of the, the previous one, you can see it comes over here. And now we take this 2a minus 2a3, and we slide it until we get to the tip of that guy, so it comes down here. So this is our new resulting vector after we add those together. So we go here, here, and here, which is just those three vectors all put tail to tip to tail all the way. And so the resulting way we would write this is 4a1 plus 6a2 minus 2a3, which is this guy right here. And we can determine what that new length or better way to phrase that magnitude of this vector uh, by taking the magnitudes of the previous three, squaring them together, squaring them, adding them together, and then taking the square root. So the distance of this new resultant vector would be about 7.483. So using this approach, it's evident that any three-dimensional vector can now be represented as a combination of multiples of the three unit vectors that we've already defined, A1, A2, and 3. So let's look at some examples of that. So here, this is just making sure we understand the notation, we have this new vector A. So remember, it's bold-faced, and so that means it's a vector, so it has a magnitude and a direction. And so this new vector is really a result of these components. So we've got our A1, A2, and 3 directions, right? 
And so now we have this a1 magnitude times the a1 vector, this a2 magnitude times the a2 vector, and a3 magnitude, which is a scalar, times the a3 vector. So these, these large italicized non-bold are scalar magnitudes times these unit vectors. And so when we add all those up, that new resultant vector is a. Same thing with b and c. So we have three new vectors that we can express all three of them in terms of these new unit vectors uh, that we've just recently defined. So what about uh, addition of vectors? Let's look at an example of how do we add vectors. So here's an example here if we wanted to say the previous vectors we just defined, if we want to take a plus b. So uh, here we just write, the, write it out longhand. We take this is a, our vector a, plus our vector b here. So when we do this, we should be able to combine like terms. So what does that look like? So we've got the a1 is times a1 and the b1 is times a1. So we can add those together and they're still times the a1. Again, the a2 and the b2 are both times a2 and the a3 and the b3 are both times a3. So uh, that's the simplest way to explain that, that you just add the like terms. And of course, the same is true just in the opposite direction for subtracting vectors. If we were to say a minus c, again, we subtract like terms here. So now a1 minus c1 times a1, a2 minus c2, and then a3 minus c3. And so that would be our resulting vector there. Now, just because we have a vector, that doesn't mean we can't have them interacting with scalars. We can multiply a scalar times a vector. When we do that, uh, this is the way we represent that, we simply just take the scalar and multiply it times each uh, component in the vector because it doesn't have a direction associated with it, so it can go uh, be multiplied by all of them. So here you see it's ma1, a1, ma2, a2, ma3, a3, uh, and so that works. And then division by a scalar works, of course, the same way. So here if we take that original vector b and we divide it by a scalar n, that's the same as just multiplying b times 1 over n. So here we just multiply each item in the vector by that scalar again. doesn't matter if it's a, a fraction or a whole number, uh, which would result in multiplication or division. They both work, or they all work the same. So we've already looked at this a little bit, but uh, you know we want to make sure we understand this concept of the magnitude of a vector. So when you see a vector with these bars on each side, that means we want to know what the magnitude of the vector is or the length of that graphical representation of the vector is. And so I think we've already established that you know the way we can do that is to take the magnitude of each component, the a1, the a2, and the a3, square them, add them together, and then take the square root. So that's going to give us the magnitude. So one, one thing that this allows us to do then uh, if we wanted to, and we'll see that this will be useful as we get into electromagnetics later on, is that now we can define a unit vector in the direction of A. So A probably does not lie on any of these axes, right? Like we've seen before, it's going to be in a totally different direction than A1, A2, A3. So we may want a unit vector in that direction. So how do we do that? We can take this magnitude now, and this would allow us to define the new unit vector in that direction. And the way we do that is we take the original vector and divide it by the magnitude of the vector. And so this will define, we see we use this lowercase a to indicate that this is now a unit vector in the direction of a. And so we've got a times the magnitude of a. And so uh, hopefully that would be clear that if we have the magnitude of this vector and we divide it by the same value, that'll give us a unit vector or one in that direction. So another important concept that we need to make sure we understand is the dot product of two vectors when we're dealing with the, with, with vector uh, manipulation. So let's look at the case here. How is this defined? So if we take a dot b, this is defined as then taking the magnitude of a, multiply it times the magnitude of b, and then we want to take the cosine of the angle between these two. So there should be some angle between them because they have their own directions associated with them. They'll be in different directions. Well, 
the magnitude of A is just a scalar we'll call A, and the magnitude of B is just a scalar we'll call B. So we can rewrite this as A times B times the cosine of the angle between them. So again, these are scalar magnitudes of those. So the commutative property then holds for dot products. And you can see when we dot two vectors, the resultant's a scalar, right? We don't get a vector out of this process. So what this tells us then, if the commutative property holds, if we take a dot b, which is a times b times cosine theta, and we swap the b and the a, so that's b times a times cosine theta, well, by definition, that's b dot a. So here we've proven that a dot b is equal to b dot a. So that's the commutative property. So what does it mean when we do a dot product? Well, a good example here, so if we had this vector a and this vector b and this angle between them, if we take the scalar value of a and the scalar value of b and multiply them together times this cosine of this angle, the new result would be this scalar length right here. That's b cosine alpha. And so what many people refer to this then is that the dot product um, it's simply finding the projection projection of one vector onto another vector. And so again, the result is always scalar. So one way I heard it described was, you know, if you take this arrangement and I were to shine a light straight down on it, the resultant of the dot product would be the shadow cast on A by B type of thing. So, uh, you know, this will be useful later. We'll see as we're doing uh, working with electromagnetic fields. So we need to look at some properties of dot products of two vectors. So as to do this, let's consider uh, our original unit vectors, right? So we've got A1, A2, and 3. Remember, they're orthogonal, and they both all have magnitudes of unit 1. So we could just do an array like this, where we dot product all of them. So A1 dot A1, A2 dot A1, A3 dot A1, so on and so forth. So if we look at this, the first thing we notice is once we dot a vector with itself, uh, at least unit vectors, the result is always 1. The next thing we notice then is if we dot any non-identical unit vectors, the result is always 0. So the result of this is the common in indices, unit vectors, are orthogonal. Therefore, the angle between them is 90 degrees. And so the cosine of 90 degrees is always zero. So because these are orthogonal, every time we dot them together, if they're not in the same direction, we're going to get a zero. So this is a very useful property that we'll make use of quite a bit. So next we want to look at the distributive property uh, for dot products. And so again, we find that this holds. So if I say a dot b plus c, I can distribute this inside of there and say a dot b plus a dot c. And so that will hold, uh, and that is a valid uh, uh, property for dot vectors. So let's take a look at this for a minute then. So what, how, do we, how do we evaluate this? So if we say uh, a dot b, what does that look like? What does that mean? Especially if it's made up of components. So what we have here then is our original vector a, remember each magnitude times unit vector, dotted with our original vector b, which is all of scalar magnitudes, again times a1, a2, a3 directions, right? So if we write this out and distribute everything out, we have a1 dot a1 times b1 a1, right? And then a1 a1 times b2 a2, which is uh, this term here. And then a1 a1 times b3 b3, which is this here. So we can continue that out until we've distributed everything out. But here's where we can make use of those properties that we just defined a minute ago. Um, we'll notice uh, this first term, a1 dot a1, that should give me 1, right? But a1 dot a2, we said that should give us 0. So if we look at all the non-like indices, those immediately go to 0. So we don't even have to evaluate anything else on those. Those, are, uh, those go away. And then the ones that are left, well, that gives us just a 1, scalar 1. So the resultant then is of A dot B 
is A1, B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3. So we're basically multiplying the like components uh, and then adding them together to get us the result. So that, that's, the, that's the bottom line or the definition of what a dot product is. And again, we want to we want to make note of here that taking the dot product of two vectors, we simply add the products of the like components of the two vectors, and the result is a scalar. It is not a vector, it is a scalar, so it does not have any direction associated with it. So next we want to consider another operation that we can do with two vectors, and that's the cross product. Very important concept here. So by definition, uh, when we take the cross product, again, we take the magnitude of A, multiply it times the magnitude of B, and this time we take the sine of the angle between the two of them. But now we have a new component, a new part of the equation here, and this is this A sub N. So this is a unit vector now in a new direction that is orthogonal to both A and B. So we get a new vector, whereas before in the dot product, we didn't get a new vector, we got a scalar. With the cross product, we do get a new vector. And the new vector here is A times B, the magnitudes, times the sine of the angles between them, times a unit vector that is both orthogonal or at a right angle of both A and B. Okay. So if we look at this graphically, and again, we want to do this right-hand rule, right? Um, we have this where A and B are in the same plane, and this A sub N is normal or 90 degrees to this plane that they're like they're on the both in the same sheet of paper there right so when taking the cross product the result is always a new vector that is perpendicular to both of the original vectors so let's think about this for a minute then so the cross product for the standard unit vectors we did this with the dot products of a of a1 a2 3 let's look at the cross products of a1 a2 a3 so again, we can take, uh, as we did before, all these uh, vectors the way they were. So now if we consider A1 cross A1, well, the angle between those is 0. Now, before we took the cosine of 0, which gave us 1, but this time we're taking the sine of 0, which gives us 0. So this tells us now that all the like indices will be 0, which is opposite of what we had before. So now we have to take into consideration these other components. So now if I do A cross A1 cross A2 using that right-hand rule, that gives me A3. But if I do A1 cross A3, that gives me a unit vector in the opposite direction of A2. So again, you can do these cross products yourself as you want, but you can see uh, when you do unlike indices of unit vectors in a cross product, you get the third uh, unit vector that you uh, that completes the the set of the coordinates uh, depending on which way your cross product is going it's either going to be a negative or a positive using the right hand rule so the non-common indices unit vectors now uh, are zero the cross product of the remaining is the form of the non-used unit vector which is sine depending on the order uh, the commutative property does not hold for cross products. It did for dot products, but it does not for cross products. So let's look at why that is. So let's take an example of B crossed with A. So here we take the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A and multiply it times the sine of the angle between them. Okay, and we're going to say that that's going to go in the negative uh, unit vector direction of A sub N, right? Uh, so what this would mean then is we would have just the scalar A, scalar B times the sine of alpha associated with this negative unit vector. Well, we can bring this negative sign outside of there to give us uh, A, B, right? Well, but this is going to, by definition, is the negative of A cross B. So here we see that B cross A is not equal to negative not equal to a cross b it's equal to negative a cross b so that means the commutative property does not hold and so that's an important thing uh, to keep in mind uh, the distributive property though does hold for cross products so as we have looked at before a crossed with b plus c does equal to a cross b plus a cross c so we can just distribute that throughout there so as we did before let's 
work through this then and uh, see how this works um, with uh, do working it out by hand. So if we take our original vector again, A, which we've seen before, we cross that with B. Okay, so again, we can distribute this because distributive property holds. So that means that A1, A1 crossed with B1, A1. That's this term here. And then we can say A1, A1 crossed with B2, A2. So that's here. A1, A1 crossed with B3, A3 is here. And so we do that for each of the terms, right? And so again, we notice as we did before at the dot product, we have these guys that are like terms. So A1 crossed with A1, no matter what's multiplied by it, uh, that's going to be zero. So these three terms right here will drop out immediately, right? Because they're going to be, uh, by definition, zero when we do the cross product of, of like unit vectors. So the result then will be combining like terms again of what we had before. So A2B3 uh, times A1. So that would be uh, A2B3 right here. A2B3 the a2 and the a3 give me an a1 and then the a3 b2 so that's your a3 b2 your a3 and a2 give me an a1 so where do these come from again because this can be a little bit confusing well these are the terms that are left right that are non-zero and you can see this is where they line up this helps us to visualize uh, where each term comes from and this looks a little bit messy right it looks a little bit confusing uh, that's why I'm happy to report that there is a better way to do this. It's a little less confusing, and you can usually do it a bit quicker. So let's look at that. So probably one of the um, easiest ways to visualize or to think about the cross product is to use determinants. So if you've had any linear algebra, you've seen this before, but you don't have to have linear algebra to, to, to understand how this works. So when we do cross products, we build what's called this determinant or this array and so we put the unit vectors across the top so it's just a1 a2 a3 and then we put the magnitudes of the first vector a2 a1 a2 a3 there and the magnitudes of the second vector on the bottom row okay so now we can step through this uh, by doing determinants so the first step as we start with the first element or the first unit vector we draw a line through that row and through that column and so that means everything we deal with from here is associated with A1. So if we put that A1, that's the one that was crossed out. And now we take the determinant. So the determinant means we do these cross product, and this is where this comes from. So we take the A2 times the B3, that goes in that spot. And then we do the other uh, diagonal, which is A3 times B2, and that, it's a sign reversal. Uh, and then that's where that term comes from. So that takes care of the first term. We can do that again for the second term, right? So we draw a line through the column and the row associated with A2. And so that means that everything that we do here is associated with A2. And so now we take A1, B3, and we're going to make that the second term because for even numbered columns, if you had a larger array, uh, there's a sign reversal there. Okay. And so then uh, A3, B1 will be the first term. Uh, so again, note there is a sign reversal for even numbered columns. And then finally, we can do the last one by drawing the lines through the row and column associated with A3. So that gives us again our A3 unit vector. We take B1, A1, B2 is the first term minus the A2, B1, and that gives us our result. So now we can look at the triple cross product. So this involves the cross product of three vectors. So care should be taken uh, in this case as the order of the evaluation does matter. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at an example here. Uh, we'll take A1, uh, excuse me, vector A, which is just the unit vector in the A1 direction. We'll take a vector B which again is just a vector in the A1 direction. It can be anything we want, and this is what we're making it. And then we'll take a vector C, and we'll say oh, that's just represented by a unit vector in the A2 direction. Now, again, this is a super simple example, but this helps you to understand why uh, the, the order matters. So if we take 
A cross B cross C, and we do the B cross C part first. We put in our A1, A1, and A2 for A, B, and C. So A1 crossed A2 gives us A3. So now we have A1 crossed with A3. If we look back at that table before, that's going to give us a negative A2. Easy enough, right? Well, what happens if we change the parentheses? So now we're going to do this part first. All right, so again, we've got our A1 for A, our A1 for B, and our A2 for C. So now if we do A1 crossed A1, that's zero by definition. We saw that earlier. So now we've got zero crossed with A2, and that's zero. So now that shows us that this does not equal this. A, if we put the parentheses around the B and the C, and then the parentheses around the A and the B, we will not get the same result. Super important to remember that as we move forward. So this is important. It can be seen from the, the above example. <clears throat> the order of evaluation is critical with, with cross products. Finally, we want to look at the scalar triple product. So this involves three vectors in a dot product operation and a cross product operation. So as a result, uh, we get something like this. So we'll have A dot B cross C. So if we put these vectors in, remember we can write B cross C as this uh, array that we can take the determinants on, and A, we just fill in right here that we're dotting with that. Well, when you're doing this action, you can simply take the magnitudes of the A vector and replace them with the unit vectors. And the reason for that is if we say A1 dot A1, that gives us 1 times A. A2 dot A2 gives us 1 times this A2, so on and so forth. So that's what we get from that. And it's one thing that's interesting to note here is that you can uh, shift this around. A dot B cross C is the same as B dot C cross A is the same as C dot A cross B. Feel free to try that out on your own. Uh, you'll see that it is true. Okay, so finally, uh, let's go ahead and look at some examples. Um, what we have here, so if we're giving given a vector, given three vectors, a is equal to a1 plus a2, b is equal to a1 plus 2a2 minus 2a3, and c is equal to a2 plus 2a3. If we do a plus b, it's going to equal to the original a from here, the original b from there. So if we add like terms, we have 2, 3, and minus 2. So that gives us that. Say b minus c, again our original b, our original c, Subtract like terms, we should get a1 plus a2 uh, minus 4a3. Multiply by a scalar. 4c is equal to uh, 4a2. 4 times 2 is 8a3. Uh, here we can take the magnitude of b. So if we get our original vector b, which means we just take the magnitude of the scalar squared. So that's 1 squared, 2 squared should be a minus 2 squared. Um, add those together, take the square root, 3 to the square root of 9, that will give us 3. So now if we wanted to find this unit vector in the direction of b, uh, we take b and divide by the magnitude. So this is our original b up here, a, a1 plus 2a2 minus 2a3, divide by that magnitude we just calculated of 3. And so that gives us this new vector uh, one third plus two thirds a two minus two thirds a three, which should give us a magnitude of one uh, in this new direction. And then we dot the products. Here we just add the products of the like components. Again, gives us three. And then a crossed b. I'll leave this for you guys to work out.